We're continuing our series this morning called Counsel from the Cross. We're looking at four of the biggest counseling issues that we face in society today. And this morning is uh, about being a control freak. And I was reminded recently of how big of a control freak I still am, even after all these years of being a Christian. And uh, I struggle mightily with giving up control of my life. And um, it, it kind of like happened in a really startling way a few years ago. And it was during the week of Thanksgiving, um, I got the flu. And I had not gotten the flu in so long, I'd forgotten there's a difference between getting a cold and getting the flu. There's a big difference, right? And so I had not gotten the flu in like 15 years, and I got level. This thing put me on my back, and I was out of commission for like a week. And immediately, I began to worry about my kids, because it's the week of Thanksgiving. And everyone knows the week of Thanksgiving, all the good doctors usually go on vacation, right? So my pediatrician was on vacation that week. The office was closed. So if my kids get sick, I've got to go to the ER. i got to shell out a lot of money. They never have a specialist on hand. And if they do have to call someone, it's going to be someone that's not going to be on vacation that week, which means they probably drank more in med school than they study, right? Because all the really good doctors are going to be away with their families on Thanksgiving. So I started to spaz out because I didn't want my kids getting the flu that I had. And so I started doing everything in my power, as I saw it, to prevent any germs from getting on my kids at all. So I like basically sequestered myself like a hung jury back in my bedroom, okay? And I didn't come out for like four days. And my wife Lysol the entire house, like thick, like seriously, there was like a Lysol cloud that like floated around. Everyone's eyes were bloodshot, like, you know, coughing, you know, <laughs> throats were itchy. It was like, it was miserable. Um, but I sequestered myself back there, and you know how much God loved me? You know what he did? He actually allowed more adversity into that very week. Because that same week, God allowed even more hardship to come into my life. And don't you know, like, whenever you spaz out and try to control things, have you ever noticed that, like, more trouble and adversity hits? You ever notice that? God actually goes to war against our self-sufficiency. He does. He goes to war against it. And uh, that very same week that I got the flu, sickest I had been in like 15 years, my youngest son at the time, Jonathan, discovered his two favorite things that were new to play in. Toilets and trash cans. <laughs> Dead serious. Exact same week. He was one and a half, and it's like that one and a half mark that kids go through where like all of a sudden they decide they need to find food and water in case the adults like just skip town, you know? So he like, seriously, like every time we turned around, he was like splashing in the toilet or digging in a trash can. And so this added to my spasm, you know, I was spazzing out hard because I'm trying to keep him away from the germs and he's like diving into the germs. And so listen, I did everything I could, sequestered myself. And um, what happened was uh, one morning I couldn't finish my egos. So my wife took, you know, my plate of food from the back bedroom and she went, she scraped them off in the trash and she turned around for a second. And by the time, you know what she's going, she turned back around. Jonathan had fished Diego out of the trash and was eating it, bro. <laughs> Fully exposing himself to my germs, okay? So before I prayed about it, I jumped on Google, you know, which I never recommend doing if you're, a, you know, a cyber conjurer, they call them today. Have you heard of that term? You know? Um, so I jumped. I was like, what happens to one-year-olds when they get the flu? And it totally scared me. And I spent the rest of that week spazzing out and worrying about my kid getting the flu and, and like, dying, but it never happened. And God protected my kids, and it just reminded me again of like how sim how simple and foolish and like naive for me to like feel like I've got to control my life and be a control freak when God does a far better job caring for me than I ever could. And it reminded me how silly it is to to be a control freak, but I'm still addicted to control. I wish I could tell you that that cured me, but riding shotgun is not enough for me. I've got to be driving. Seriously, I have to be behind the wheel, and it frustrates me because a lot of times I'll spaz out. And take over like LeBron in my life. And then I'll look back and I'll be like, man, that was so foolish. And I'll even beat myself up. I'm like, how, why do I have such a hard time trusting God? After all these years, does Christianity even work? I mean, like I've been a Christian for all these years and I still spaz out when things go wrong. And God once again reminded me how foolish it is when I don't trust him. And really, there's two ways to live your life. There's two ways. You can either trust God and humbly submit to the events of your life. And this is called faith. Or you can try to be God, and you can attempt to control everything in your life and everyone in your life. This is called idolatry. And God reminded me, there's two ways, Jeff, that you can live your life. The first way is the way of faith. 
But the second way is the way that's more indicative, I think, of our hearts, even though it leaves us burned out and frustrated and like on the edge of irritability at all times. And I have found in my experience that many people are prone to this section, second option of living your life. That's because, listen, self-sufficiency feels right. Being control feels right and normal and natural to us. I mean, this is the reason why we're often very defensive. This is the reason why we're often standoffish and we're not willing to accept like feedback or maybe even another point of view from other people. We think that inherently our way to do things is the best, and it makes us tremendously skeptical of anyone else that's offering us any kind of advice at all. You know, not only that, but when you think about it, perhaps the worst feature of our control freedom is this. We constantly second-guess everything. We second-guess people and we're like, you know what, if I had been there, I would have never said that. If I had been in charge, things would have been different. I mean, this, this manifests itself in every realm of life. You could be on an airplane flying at 30,000 feet, and if the airplane hits too much turbulence, we get irritated and we're like, what is he doing up there? You know what I'm saying? Like, seriously. In other words, if I was up here flying this plane right now, I could do a better job avoiding the, you know, the hidden pockets of turbulence than this guy could. We are constantly second-guessing everything in our lives, and that's why when the plane actually lands, everyone claps, you know? It's like, hooray! How patronizing is that? Seriously, do you clap when the taxi pulls up in front of your house? Hey, I knew you could do it, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's crazy! But you're laughing because you're busted. Young MC said, you're still cold busted. Here's the deal. We clap because we are surprised that something could actually happen and go well without us being involved, Right? And so we find it hard to sleep on airplanes, and we clap when they land. And you know, here's the reason why. Everybody wants to rule the world. Everybody. Now, I've got good news and bad news regarding that, okay? The bad news, first of all, is God's already running the world, and he's not accepting applications right now for a replacement, okay? So he's already, you will never be God, and he's already running the world. So that's the bad news. The good news is this. God already rules the world, and he's doing a far better job thinking and caring for your life than you ever could. Far better. And that's really what Psalm 121 is all about. Psalm 121 is written for control freaks like us who are wound so tight like a guitar string, bro. We're about to bust. And God reminds us that, listen, I'm in control. I've got it. I've got your back. And, and, and here's the way that, that 2 Peter talks about how we overcome things like control freaks, you know, become, be, being a control freak in our life. Second Peter says the way we actually overcome our sin is by trusting in greater ways the promises of God. Listen to 2 Peter 1. It says, God has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them, through the promises, you may escape the corruption that's in the world because of sinful desire. The way you actually overcome being a control freak is by believing in a greater and deeper way the promises in the Bible. That's the way you actually fight your sin, we'd say around here, sanctification. Faith and promises conquer sinful desires. And so Psalm 121 was written so that it could liberate us from being control freaks in our lives. And so this morning we're going to see that the way we wean ourselves off of being control freaks is by believing Psalm 121 in a greater way. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a pen out or a pencil and flip your bulletin over because this is really, really cool. If you look at Psalm 121... There's a definite theme the psalmist has in mind, okay? We're going to get a little deep here for a second, okay? You've got to bring your scuba tank here. The snorkel won't do it. Grace lock inside. We're going to dig in the text. The word keep appears six times in this psalm. You see it in verse 3, verse 4, verse 5, twice in 7, and once in 8. And so the word keep here is a very important concept to the psalmist. We would call this a control word, or basically a key to unlocking what he's getting at in this psalm. And what's really rad is this. The word keep here in all six of these, uh, all six times it appears in these verses, the word keep here is the Hebrew word shamar. And it means literally to protect, preserve, to guard, or to watch over. In other words, God, the psalmist is telling us, is our bodyguard. He's our bodyguard. That is who God is for us, and that's what the psalmist wants us to get in 121. 
Now, this is very good news. This is good news because, because God is our bodyguard, we have protection. God has our back. And we need protection because life is very difficult. It's full of trials and tribulations. That's why in the, in the title, as Dave pointed out, this is called a song of ascents. Now, I know a lot of people didn't come to church this morning and say, you know what, honey, great news. They're going to talk about a song of ascents today. This is awesome, you know. But there's a lot implied in that title. There's a lot there. The song of ascent title means this. This is going to be a song that talks about the day in, day out trials of life. Because as Dave pointed out, people travel up to Jerusalem. And as they traveled up to Jerusalem, there were a lot of things they would encounter that could basically kill them along the way, okay? And back in those days, there was no places to stay. There was no hotels. You couldn't jump, jump on Google and find a hotel or even Pokemon. You know, you couldn't find anything like that because there was nowhere to stay. And so you were subjected to the weather at all times, which means bad weather could come at night. You could freeze to death. During the day, you could get sunstroke. It was hot. It was cold. It's the desert. And you're hiking through the desert, which is really rough terrain, and your transportation could give out. And you could also get robbed because there's people that are hiding in the rocks of those rough terrains. And not only that, if you get in trouble, you can't pick up your cell phone and call the police or 911. This was a very perilous journey. Very dangerous. So that's all like embedded in that little title where it says, A Song of Ascent. That's all in the background. And so when you read through the Psalms and you see Song of Ascent, don't think like this stroll up to Jerusalem. Think of like the Hunger Games, okay? That's what they're basically talking about. You're fleeing for your life to go to church. That's what's packed into that little title. And so there were all kinds of trouble that they could face along the way. And here's the thing. The Songs of Ascent were sung by Jewish pilgrims as they went up to Jerusalem because they would kind of like help them not to spaz out and be control freaks. They would remind themselves that, listen, I've got a God who's my bodyguard. He keeps me through anything that could possibly hurt me. That's exactly what's implied when this is called a song of ascent. And so this relates to our everyday lives. Because here's the thing. We may not be like going on a pilgrimage up to uh, you know Jerusalem, but our life is, it, it's a pilgrimage. You know, Peter says, this is not our home. We're just passing through. We're on a pilgrimage, a, a, a journey to heaven. And along the way, there's all kinds of like dangers and troubles. And, you know, life is not all barbecue and ball games, is it? I mean, the Christian life, it's, it's not a day at the spa. It's a war. Amen. I mean, every day isn't a Friday. I'm sorry, Joel. Every, every day is more like a Monday and like the Monday after daylight savings time. That's what it is, you know? It's a really, really bad Monday. Every day is not a Friday. Um, it's tough. And, and, and we need to be reminded that we have a bodyguard who has our back at all times. And so in this psalm, we see three characteristics of our bodyguard. And, and as we trust in the promises of God in a deeper way, we are liberated a little bit from being control freaks in our life. And we're going to see this bodyguard strong, vigilant, and he's sacrificial. So if you're taking outline, if you're taking notes in an outline, that there you go. He's strong, he's vigilant, and he's sacrificial. First of all, this bodyguard is strong. Check out verses 1 and 2. He says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. So here, here's the deal. The psalmist, he's like looking out over all these hills he's got a journey through to get up to Jerusalem. And he has, he has no idea what's going to await him in those hills. Could be malaria, could be robbers, could be anything, right? And this is what he says. He says, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. This is a particularly beastly phrase that the psalmist uses to refer to God when he calls him the maker of heaven and earth. Now again, the Bible needs a little bit of explanation because if the Bible said that God was the heavyweight champion of the world, we'd probably be like, whoa, dude, this guy's protected by the heavyweight champion of the world. That's, but when we hear the maker of heaven and earth, it doesn't quite wow us like it should. But here's the reality. Whenever people in the Bible get in big trouble and they need help and they call upon God, they don't call upon Lee Musin, okay? They call upon God. And when they do, they call him the maker of heaven and earth. And you see it throughout the scripture. Whenever they're in like really, really dire straits, they say, maker of heaven and earth, come help me. And that's because 
if God made the heavens and the earth, if God made everything that we see, that means God can also deliver us from everything that's made and that we can see. Does that make sense? That's why, it's so, that's why it's a beastly way to call God. He's the maker of heaven and earth. You know, it's kind of like this. Let me illustrate it this way. Let's say that, just hypothetically, this has never happened, okay? But let's say that I bought an oceanfront lot in Orm by the Sea, okay? This nice, sweet pad, and I wanted to build, like, the ultimate beach pad, okay? Surf shack. And so I call in Chip Gaines, and I'm like, hey, Chip, come help me out, bro. And he flies in from Texas, okay? And uh, he builds my house from scratch by himself. Let's just say it can happen. It's never going to happen, okay? But it would be pretty awesome if it did. So he, he basically, he draws the blueprints up. He lays the foundation. He puts the walls up, the roof. Puts on every shingle by himself, bro. Actually, it would be a tin roof, I think, if I did my own house and I had a lot of money. It would be a tin roof. But let's say he builds it by himself without any help at all. Let's say that Chip Gaines is the maker of my house. Now, let's say I move in and six months later a light bulb burns out. And I start to spaz out, and I'm like, man, what am I going to do? The light bulb just burned out in my bathroom. Oh, my gosh, you know? And let's say my wife was like, honey, just call Chip Gaines. He'll know what to do. It would be foolish for me to say, you know what, honey? I think this is beyond Chip's expertise. I don't know. You know, I know Chip built everything that's related to my house. But I think a light bulb, I think this is just beyond his control. How foolish would that be? Because if Chip Gaines is the maker of Jeff's house, then Chip Gaines can certainly replace a broken light bulb in Jeff's house. <laughs> And, and here's the deal. How much more so is this true of God? If God is the maker of heaven and earth, then God certainly can deliver us from anything that's under heaven and earth. And God is so powerful. God is so powerful that Hebrews 11 says this. It says that God literally created the world and everything in the universe out of nothing. He didn't go down to Lowe's and use materials. He didn't go to Ikea right, and get some wood glue and a couple of Allen wrenches okay, and tore the whole sucker together. He literally, it says, created the entire universe by his very word and just said, boom. Hey, I'm going to put some stars over here, bro, and the world over there. That's how he created everything. In fact, the Latin word used is ex nihilo. Everything was created out of nothing, out of thin air. It's amazing. And so if God created everything that we see out of nothing, if he's the maker of heaven and earth, then how much more is he able to deliver us from everything that's under heaven and earth? No With no problem. So the Lord, he's our bodyguard, and he's very, very strong. So that's the first point we see in this psalm. Our bodyguard is super strong. Second of all, this bodyguard is vigilant. He's on the alert at all times. And it says, the Lord will not let your foot be moved. It's not going to even slip when you're on one of those steep mountain inclines. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Now this is super, super important because again, if we dip into the context, this psalmist is like hiking through the desert and he's going to have to sleep out under the stars some nights and... Anything that comes along could, could kill him or hurt him. But the psalmist says this. He says, you know what? I can rest easy at night because guess who's always awake? Guess who's always alert and vigilant? God is. This God not only doesn't sleep, he doesn't even slumber, which is rad. It's the Hebrew word, na'um. It means he doesn't even get drowsy. God has never even like yawned once in his entire existence, Okay. He's always alert. His Facebook uh, page is always active. He's always on. He's always there, always listening to our prayers. And so God never even gets a little bit drowsy. And this is good news again for us because if God, or since God, is always vigilant, guess what? We don't have to be. Amen. The number one feeling that a control freak feels is I've got to be on all the time. If something's going to go right, I've got to be there. I've got to be involved. I have to say yes to everything. That's the heart of the control freak. And that's why when Facebook recently invented the maybe button for an event, that actually relieved a lot of us. Because before that, it was either, can you come to my event? Yes or no. We're like, oh, no, I really don't want to go. But I don't want to tell you no. So now I can click maybe. And it's like, I have no intention of going, but I want you to think I am for as long as possible. <laughs> you're all there. You know you're there. You thank God for the maybe button on Facebook because you don't want to go to everything, but you feel the pressure to go to everything because you're a control freak. And if it's going to go right, if Sally's birthday party is going to go right at Olive Garden, I have to be there. 
I've got to make sure everyone's talking. We feel the weight of the world. And listen, that's God's job. God's the one that's make, supposed to make sure it's going right because God's the vigilant one. We're not meant to be vigilant. And here's the deal. If you live your life trying to be God, trying to never slumber or never rest, and you're hyper vigilant your entire life, it's going to backfire big time. Because the Bible warns this in Psalm 37. Fret not yourself, it only leads to evil. If you feel this overwhelming desire to be involved in everything and micromanage everything, it's actually going to blow up. It's going to totally blow up, and it's going to hurt you, and it's going to hurt people around you. Let me give you one just practical example, okay? Parenting. Most of us can relate to parenting in here. The control freak is prone to be a helicopter parent. Right? Always around, always making sure they don't fall, always looking, or they get too close to the edge, i got to get out there, you know? Always trying to protect their child from danger, okay? And uh, there's a lot of, like, research coming out now um, about the dangers of helicopter parenting. I think even Stanford did a study, and, like, they, they researched and, like, they interviewed all these kids that grew up with helicopter parents and discovered there's not one single benefit of helicopter parenting. It can only hurt you. Because helicopter parenting and micromanaging your child's every movement does three things. It teaches your kid, first of all, that failure is bad instead of failure is part of life. Second of all, it instills in them an entitlement complex because it's basically teaching them they're never supposed to be sad or unhappy or get hurt. You're rescuing them before they have a chance to fail. And third, it doesn't prepare them for adulthood where failure is common. Listen, life is all about getting hit in the face and getting back up again. And if you're always helicopter parenting, if you are fretting and trying to be hypervigilant to overparent your child in every area of life, the Bible warns it's going to blow up, and now psychologists are finally catching up with the Bible and saying, this is exactly right. And listen, because a lot of young people today grew up in very small families, and they played on soft surface playgrounds their entire life, right? You know the super bouncy ones, you know? <laughs> Seriously, back in the days, man, there was like barbed wire around those freaking playgrounds, bro. Like, and you had to like scale them to get in. Today, it's all soft surface. And listen, because everyone gets a participation trophy. Seriously, what happens is we have a lot of young people that lack emotional resiliency because they've never fallen and actually busted their elbow and had to get back up again. It is sad, but it goes back to being a control freak. And you know what? A lot of parents had good intentions because their parents weren't there at all. They were alcoholics or whatever. So they were like defunct parents. So they're like, I'm not going to make that mistake. I'm going to be like the awesome ultra parent. I'm going to be everything to my kid. And guess what? That actually ends up backfiring too. And although it sounds good. You know, there's a, there's a, a, a guy I'm reading right now. He's a, he's a clinical psychologist, uh, which you shouldn't read every clinical psychologist, but a lot of people can help us with common grace. This guy's name is Jordan Peterson. And uh, he just wrote a book called 12 Rules for Life. And rule number 11 is awesome. I love rule number 11. It says, do not bother children when they are skateboarding. <laughs> it's not the Bible, but it helps, right? And he says this. He says, children are wired to attempt really, really dangerous things. Seriously. He said, if you put a playground that's too safe, he said, the kids will push the envelope and make it dangerous. If they make it too safe, it should have a little bit of element of risk to it. But he says this. Kids are hardwired to push themselves and to like be like, you know, Fight through their fears and be courageous. They're actually designed that way. And so if you go about trying to stop them from fulfilling this desire to do dangerous things like skateboarding really fast over concrete or not having a trampoline ever, he says this. What's going to happen is you're going to stop them from building up emotional resiliency because you're meant to try hard things, fail, and get back up again and try again. That's the way you're designed. And so what happens is, is, is Peterson says this. If kids are skateboarding, leave them alone. Because you want them to fight through their fears. You want them to develop courage and, you know, be confident, be self-confident as a person. And he says this, if you don't get a control on your control freak tendencies, here's what's going to happen. Your kid's going to grow up, they're going to suffer from emotional neglect, and then the minute that your kid gets a job, he's going to quit every single time. He's going to bounce from job to job to job because every time the manager says, go clean out the walk-in cooler, he's going to get his feelings hurt and quit. Because he wasn't allowed to skateboard. Amen? And you're going to end up taking care of him for the rest of your life, bro. It's going to be like El Nino. Every five years, he's going to stop back in for a visit, right? Can I live there again? It's going to happen. And so, listen, nothing is more disempowering than being a control freak and overparenting your kids. Because human beings were not intended to be gods to their kids. 
Like when I'm pushing my kid on the swing and he's like, it's time to go in for dinner. He's like, but I, I want you to push me more. And I'm like, well, I just pushed you for 30 minutes, bro. He's like, well, you never pushed me enough. And I'm like, listen, I'm sorry. I can't be your God. I'm sorry. Okay. Let's go inside. You know, I'm never going to fulfill your expectations for me. So I'm just letting you know now when you're four. So when you get to be 24, you're not like, my dad was never there for me. Listen, I'm, listen, I'm never going to be for you there all the time. Okay. I just can't be there for you all the time. It's impossible. I'm just, I'm just a human being. But fretting, being a helicopter parent, it burns your kids out, but it also burns us out because here's the deal. We were not meant to be vigilant all the time. We're just human. This is, this is how Jeremiah put it. Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength. Who trusts in himself, basically, to make sure his kids are safe all the time. For whose heart turns away, and his heart turns away from the Lord. Listen to this. He will be like a bush in the desert and will not see when prosperity comes, but will live in stony wastes in the wilderness, a land of salt without inhabitants. This is what Jeremiah is saying. When you stop trusting God to do something like taking care of your kids, and you start trusting yourself, and you feel the need to be hyper-vigilant all the time, guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to hit the wall and burn out. You're going to end up in a waste place, a withered up bush. You're going to, you're going to be out of energy. And you see the studies today about how stress and being hyper-vigilant all the time actually affects your immune system big time. It levels people. But the hyper-vigilant parent feels like they have to be on all the time. And here's the deal. When you do that, Jeremiah says, you're actually bringing a curse upon yourself because you weren't meant to live that way. And you're trying to do something that only God can do. And I would say this. If, if you come to church this morning, maybe you're like burned out, maybe you're tired. Perhaps could it be because you're trying to be God in your life? In some area. It's a very real possibility that that's the source of your fatigue because human beings, they make crummy gods. They really do. And I needed this text this week because uh, this is one of those weeks as a pastor. It's like everything was going wrong. I mean, relationships over here are breaking down, counseling over here. We found out Wednesday the building has a leak underneath it. We're trying to get that fixed. It's been leaking since February. It's leaking 50 gallons an hour. As we're sitting here, it's actually leaking water under the building. And so, like, I felt this immense prep. I just tell you that, just so you know. It may help the offering a little bit. Um, but, like, <laughs> 50 gallons an hour ain't cheap. I'll just tell you that. So, if I'm working at uh, Don Pablo's next week, you know why, right? Where's Jeff at? He's actually waiting tables right now, paying for the water bill. Um, but here's the deal. I needed this this week. I needed this reminder because here's the deal. Things were breaking down everywhere, and we have this massive leak under our building, and I'm like, I felt that just, like, this... Well, this weight to like put on a cape and be like mini Messiah, fly around, do some helicopter pastoring, you know, seriously, like, because listen, I know I'm in trouble when I start to reason that, you know, we'll fix all these problems more of Jeff. That, that's really what would do this, you know, marriage over here, building over here. You know, what would fix this is if I could just clone myself like Michael Keaton in multiplicity. If I could just clone myself and duplicate myself, it would solve everyone's problems. And God had to remind me, hey, bro, that's kind of blasphemous. That's kind of like my job, you know. <laughs> But if I feel like I need to be like super pastor, like a helicopter pastor, I'm missing the boat because that's God's job. And God gently reminded me, he's like, listen, bro, just, just, just relax. He's like, enjoy the ride. I literally, I sense that this week, enjoy the ride. I've got this. And I needed that reminder because I needed to be reminded that my gut instincts of taking control are usually dead wrong. And here's the deal. Do you know what trusting God feels like when you haven't done it in a long time? It feels like being out of control. <laughs> How much easier is it to just trust in what we can do and what we can accomplish? And if I was there, if I was in that counseling appointment, I wonder what that way. Da, 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 da. We always second guess, and when we get that way, we're actually taking a role that's designed just for God. That's God's dominion. And resting in God is a very, very important thing we have to learn. Because here's the deal. Resting in God and not fretting and not being a control freak is not just the Christian thing to do. It's actually the human thing to do. Because you got to think about it this way. Before we even fell into sin in the Garden of Eden, human beings, before we even fell, God already instituted a rest for us. You don't rest because you're a sinner. You rest because you're a human being. So even without the sin, we still need to rest, is what the Bible teaches us. In fact, you know what's crazy? The very first commandment that God gave to Adam and Eve was to rest. Did you know that? Think about this. World created in six days. Adam and Eve created on the, the sixth day, right? On the seventh day, what happened? 
Okay, so just watch this. God creates Adam and Eve. They're people now. Next day, Adam gets up for work, gets his lunchbox, walks in. Hey, God, what are you going to do today? How should I glorify your name? God says, take a break. Mine equals boom. Seriously, very first thing God told Adam and Eve is to rest. Take a day off. And here's the deal. If that was true of very perfect human beings, flawless human beings with no sin in a perfect environment, how much more important is it for us to rest in God and God alone? Even after the fall, even after sin jacks our hearts up, how much more important is it for us to maybe paddle out and get some surf for a few hours and just detach and say, you know what? The world can actually keep orbiting without me. Because we're all going to learn that one day. We're all going to be dead one day, and the world's going to keep going. And then we're really going to find out, you know what? It's not all riding on my shoulders. You don't have to fear about saying no to something. You're not letting God down because you're not the one holding God up. You're not. He upholds everything in, in the power and his glory. And so we got to remember this. God's got this. Whatever it is, this bodyguard is vigilant. He's got it. And so however that applies to your life, uh, take that and, and, and pray the Holy Spirit would use it. Because this bodyguard's vigilant, we don't have to be. The third characteristic we see of a bodyguard is this bodyguard is sacrificial. And here's the deal, guys. You can't be a bodyguard unless you're willing to sacrifice for the person you're protecting. You can be the biggest, baddest steroid monkey on the block. But if you do not step in front of the bullet when it's coming for Reagan or whoever, you cannot be a bodyguard. You have to be willing to lay down your life for another. And listen, this bodyguard is tremendously sacrificial. We begin to see that in verse 5. Look at verse 5. It's so deep. It says, The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. That's very, very important because shade is super important in the desert. The temperatures get extremely hot over 100 degrees routinely in the desert. And shade in the desert is often the difference between life and death. Finding a tree that you can like rest under and get some shade is literally what will save people's lives back in those days. And so the psalmist is saying that God is our shade to protect us. Now just think about this for a second. Um, how does a shade work? Well, shade, basically, it comes in between you and whatever's like, trying to like, harm you or threaten you, the sun's rays, whatever it is. The shade steps in between whatever could do you great harm, and it takes the heat in your place. That's the language of substitution and sacrifice. Can you guys feel me this morning? That's what a shade does. And the bodyguard will protect us from anything that threatens us. It will shade us from anything that is threatening to, to hurt us. And verse 7 says, The Lord will even preserve your life. In the Hebrew, it's nefesh. It's literally the soul. This is the same word used in Genesis 2-7 when God breathed the, word of, the, the breath of life into human beings. And man became a living being. Same word. So this bodyguard is not like an earthly bodyguard. He will go so far as to even protect your very soul. And listen, this is a direct reference to the person in the work of Jesus Christ. All scripture testifies of Jesus. That's what Jesus himself said. And this scripture refers specifically to Jesus Christ because on the cross, think of it this way. When you look at the cross, Jesus Christ was acting as our shade. If you're new to church, when Jesus was on the cross, okay, he was not just suffering physically. He was also suffering spiritually. God punished Jesus and poured out his wrath and anger upon Jesus in the way it would have been poured out upon us for all eternity. And so Jesus on the cross literally stepped in between God's wrath and us and took the heat. He was acting as a shade. And so when you look at the cross, think of it this way. You know what the cross is? The cross is Jesus providing us a place in his shade. That's what the cross is. As you think about the cross, it's Jesus stepping in between the punishment and the wrath and the anger of God that was due us because of our sin. He's stepping in between and saying, I'll take the heat for you. That's the cross. And in order for Jesus to protect our souls, he had to basically give up his life. And friends, listen, 
This is what makes Christianity different from every other religion in the entire world, everything else. Because, listen, every other religion basically boils down to this, no matter what it is, Buddhism, Islam, whatever. It's this. False religion says, God's saying this, be my bodyguard, protect me, die for me, lay down your life for me, sacrifice for me. That's false religion. Christianity is the exact opposite. Christianity is God saying, I'm your bodyguard. I'm laying down my life for you. I'm protecting you. I'm giving my life for yours. This is why Christianity is different than every other religion in the world. Because the essence of Christianity is not our sacrifice for God. It's God's sacrifice for us. That's why the symbol for Christianity is a cross and not a ladder. We're like, hey, I'm going to go up to heaven. Check out God. That's not about that. It's about God coming down and saying, I'm your bodyguard, bro. I'm stepping in between what was going to hurt you. And I'm saving you. That's the essence of Christianity. And you know what blows me away when I think about this text? Bodyguards are usually nobodies protecting somebodies. You've seen the bodyguard, right? Whitney Houston, bro. You got to protect her, right? Most of you probably seen the bodyguard. You haven't, haven't seen it in a while. I probably should endorse it. Um, you know how that is in your VC days. You're like, man, check the Goonies out. And you go back and watch the Goonies again. You're like, that's probably not a good movie that I should recommend. You know? <laughs> You know, no filter back in those BC days. But here's the deal. Um, that was for free. Um, we talked about parenting and movies today, honey. Um, here's the deal, though. Here's the deal. When you think about Christianity, and when you think about what a bodyguard does, it's a nobody protecting a somebody. It's usually bodyguards are peasants protecting the king. Right? That's why when you see, like, Trump on TV, the Secret Service don't have name tags on because no one cares who they are. It's like, hey, I'm Bob. Hey, I'm Bob. Hey, he's protecting Trump. It's not, it's not about this. It's not about the Secret Service guy. He's a nobody protecting a somebody. In Christianity, it's the exact opposite. It's the somebody protecting the nobodies. It's the king saying, I'm your bodyguard. I'm giving my life for you. I'm laying my life down for you. How mind blowing is that? Not only that it's a somebody protecting a nobody, but it's actually the king. Not only giving his life for the peasants, it's the king giving his life for the criminals in his kingdom. That's the essence of the gospel. That's the essence of Christianity. And here's what Romans says. Here's just how Paul sums it up. If he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all on the cross, if he did that, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? In other words, let me translate it. If God was willing to do that, if God was willing to preserve you and shade you from the worst possible thing that could have ever happened to you, how much more concerned is God in your day in, day out, daily grind? That's what Paul's saying. If God did that, if God's providing for you, you know this as a parent, if your parent is willing to provide for you all these things, you know, don't you trust them in the smaller things in life? Of course. Because the cross shows us the extent to which God will protect us, even laying down his life for ours. So this bodyguard is sacrificial. And I want to say this. If you have never asked this bodyguard to protect you before, if, if, you're, if you're coming this morning and you're kind of seeking, you're just checking Christianity out, allow me to lead you in a prayer uh, of repentance and faith, okay? And I would ask you to put your faith in this bodyguard this morning. Pray with me. Let's bow our heads. Father, I confess that uh, I want you to be my bodyguard. I confess that I've been running from you. I've been trying to be you. I've been trying to be everything that everyone has ever clear said. I'm trying to be God, and it's burning me out. And so, God, liberate me from my control freak tendencies, and I ask that you come into my heart and save me and rescue me. Thank you that you stepped in between the wrath of God in myself and how you shade me and how because of the cross I will never see the back of your hand. I will never be judged in a punitive way. You may spank us at times when we're bad but you're not going to kick us out of the house. And I thank you that because of the cross you save us from the worst thing that could have ever happened to us because you love us. God, capture us with your love and liberate us as we gaze on the cross from being control freaks. We pray for that. Uh, bless these monies to the purpose and furtherance of your kingdom and even to pay for water bills. We pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen.